All right, so welcome to the Shot You Don't Want to Take, uh, a seminar in addiction and mental health in sport. Really appreciate everybody's time and efforts in, in carving this into your schedule. Um, paying to be here again, just want to remind everybody that 100% of the registration fees are going to advocates for mental health uh, and addiction in the sports space. Um, my name is James Gardner. I'll be hosting and emceeing this evening. I'm a certified athletic therapist and certified strength and conditioning specialist. Uh, that's my realm. That's my role. Um, but again, I wanted to thank everybody for being here. And, and we have a, a great lineup, uh, a great topic. And obviously, um, there was an investigation on TSN in the sports space a couple of weeks ago that we can talk about at the end um, and potentially throughout the, the course of this seminar this evening. Uh, we have Jens Kasten, Mike Stroh and a couple people from CCMHS, the Canadian Center for Mental Health and Sport here, Krista Van Slingerland and Poppy Desk Clouds. Those are the panel guests for the evening and we will make sure that we hear from each and every one of them. My job again is sort of to take us through this and uh, where did this stem from, this seminar, where did it stem from and where do we intend on going tonight? So those are the couple questions that I'll start off answering and, and this stemmed from uh, a podcast that I host called First Star Let's Chat, an athletic therapy round table. Uh, session 37 had a young man on whose name is Brady Leovold. Brady was uh, on a fast track to play professional hockey um, and fell into uh, addiction and mental health. And in sharing his story on the podcast and through his own podcast, um, it was very raw and very real and eye-opening. And uh, I took, took a step back as a practitioner and said, what is it that I can do? What can I house as a practitioner to help in this space and in talking with Brady and in talking with Jens and with Mike uh, education that's where I came around to and and what can we do to help so this is where this seminar uh, intends to go is opening the conversation to how do we have the conversation when do we have the conversation what do we say what don't we say how do we refer what resources can we use all of those things we hope to at least uh, open the door to this evening and get people connected to having the conversation. So what can we do to help as practitioners? My viewpoint has shifted uh, drastically over the last few years. And the one thing that we can do in any situation is listen. And when we listen, we become an aid in the solution to any problem. We listen warmly, we listen openly, and we listen with intent. And by listening, we can be a part of the solution. We don't have to have all the answers, but by listening, we will be a part of that solution. Um, I was speaking with a bunch of colleagues. Uh, I analyzed it myself, analyzed my feelings and my reactions to the TSN special, the problem of pain, which was a couple of weeks ago. And a lot of people got their backs up about what was presented. Some other people really had their eyes open about what was presented. Uh, and then there were a bunch of people in between at opposite ends of the spectrum in the middle somewhere. Um, collectively as a group, Jens, Mike and myself uh, agreed that this is an opportunity for us to be a part of the solution by having the conversation. So again, this is the evening, this is the plan, and this is where we intend to go, is to bring us to the conversation so that we can all enter the space together and support one another. Jens Kasten is a certified sports psychology coach. Mike Stroh just recently completed his MA in counseling psychology. And these are our primary panel guests for the evening. And then again, uh, Krista Van Slingerland and Poppy Desk Clouds are here from CCMHS. Um, but before we get to them, Jens, uh, why don't you say hello, just introduce yourself to everybody, and then Mike will jump over to you after that. Thank you so much, James. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's so great to be here. It's an honor to be able to speak in front of all of you uh, practitioners and experts. And uh, I'm very grateful to James that he invited me to be part of this panel. So like James said, my name is Jens Kasten. I am born and raised German. I played 21 years of professional hockey in Germany as a goaltender. And after my retirement, I dabbled in management and sports marketing. Uh, I became an athletic therapist, but all along I've been mentoring and mental coaching young athletes and uh, up to the professional level. Um, I currently work, at, as Mike said, as a sports psychology coach, psychology coach, and um, I am daily confronted with uh, addiction and mental health. Again, it's great to be here. Thank you so much, and I look forward to this. 
Awesome. Th thanks, Jens. And it's uh, it's amazing to have you here and to carve in the time to putting this presentation together uh, with Mike. So really appreciate that and look forward to, to hearing from you and your experiences along the way. Uh, Mike Stroh, uh, MA in Counseling Psychology. Mike, I'll throw it over to you to say hi, and then we'll jump over to, to our friends at CCMHS. Sure. Thank you, James. And, and at, at all, as they say, um, it's lovely to be here. You know, my name, as I said, is Mike Stroh. I'm the founder of a mental health consultancy that specializes in K-12 education and workplace mental health called Starts With Me. And it was really born out of my personal and family catastrophes and subsequent healing and journey of well-being and being of service to others. I lived with addiction and mental illness for about 18 years. I'm a caregiver to my brother who lives with schizophrenia. And um, I've had the beautiful opportunity of making all of this uh, part of my life. Um, and I'm incredibly grateful for that. I'm also incredibly inspired and amazed by all the people that are here having this conversation. It's clear that this is important, that people care about this and that we, there's a collective pull towards figuring out how we can improve our way of helping people. And um, I hope to be able to contribute to that conversation today. So thanks. Yeah, thanks, Mike. And uh, I think just by being here and, and knowing that we are uh, in the space together, talking about it in the sports realm uh, may be a little bit different, but at the same time, this is applicable in, in personal lives and uh, and family lives for, for probably everybody on the call in some form or facet. So I appreciate the share and appreciate you being here, Mike. And uh, Krista and Poppy, I'll throw it over to you guys at the CCMHS and let you roll through uh, your center and all the great things that you're doing there in Ottawa. And thanks guys and thanks for having us. I'm gonna just share my screen, I hope. <laughs> I closed ours, there you go, all right. Okay, cool. And let's go full screen, great. Is it happening? Oh. <laughs> slowly, but it's, okay. slowly, but it's happening. I it's had to break the wheel of death for a second, I was concerned, <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm Krista Van Slingerland. I'm the executive director at the Canadian Centre for Mental Health and Sport. Uh, I was a, a formerly a basketball player, came through my own mental health issues, and that led me to do a master's and a PhD focused on uh, mental health and sport. And I'm joined by Poppy Day Clouds. Actually, I think the next slide, yeah. Krista, you're... It is black. It's black. Yeah. It's doing what it really? Doing. Yeah. Okay, hold yeah. the phone. <laughs> I'm sorry you guys are <laughs> no problem no we won't we won't blame zoom openly but we'll just uh, we'll get it figured out here yeah there you go beautiful you're seeing things oh okay good cool okay <laughs> um poppy is joining me um she's a mental performance consultant and the director of care and education at the center and also a phd candidate so I'll tell you a little bit about how the center came to be. We're only a couple of years old. Uh, we were founded in 2018 by Dr. Natalie Duran Bush and myself. Um, and the center was actually born out of my PhD research. So we did a participatory uh, approach to research. And so 20 stakeholders from the realms of sport, academia, and mental health helped us design the center. Uh, and so we began offering sport informed mental health care to athletes and coaches, although we've expanded who we care for, and Poppy will tell you about that a little later, um, in November of 2018, both virtually and in person. Over 13 months, we tested and refined our model and evaluated its effectiveness. And we were fortunate to gain charitable status in April of 2020. And so this year, what we've really been focusing on is in increasing the scope of our reach across Canada so that we can help as many people as possible. We exist, and I mean, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here. We exist because we know that mental illness and mental health challenges affect everyone, and that includes athletes. Uh, and while there's a huge body of research that shows us that sport uh, in a recreational setting can enhance mental health, when you get into the competitive and high performance realm, there are unique factors that are specific to sport that can increase athletes' risk of experience, like experiencing psychological concerns, uh, exacerbate existing concerns or trigger new ones. 
The other thing we know, mostly from anecdotal evidence, but more research is showing us this, is that sport participants have unique needs when it comes to mental health care, and they often prefer practitioners who have a background and understanding in sport. So uh, what do we actually do at CCMHS? Uh, we take a three-pronged approach, one of which is a little bit more front and center. It's the thing that's most visible, um, and that's our mental health care. So we provide collaborative sport-informed mental health care from coast to coast. So all the way across Canada, we have practitioners in every province across Canada. Um, and we work in a kind of unique model that Chris is going to talk about a little more. Um, but the really important piece here is that all of our practitioners work from a sport-informed lens. So this means they either have personal sport experience, they have mental performance consulting training, or a mixture of the two, plus their mental health uh, competencies. We also do research and community engagement. The research is so that we're constantly using evidence-based practices, but also contributing to the understanding of mental health in sport, which is still lacking pretty tremendously right now. Um, and then community engagement allows us to expand our reach through grassroots sports all the way to high performance in order to connect with different communities and stakeholders. So that includes people like athletic therapists, the integrated sport teams and coaches so that we can start to reduce the stigma surrounding mental illness and start to get everybody engaged in the maintenance of mental health in sport. I'm sorry, Poppy, my slide's not, there we go. Um, so at the center, we do have eligibility criteria, and uh, this is ever expanding for us because we always want to increase our reach. Um, when we first started, we had to really focus our scope, and even over the last year, we've expanded already. So we care for Canadian citizens, um, and they have to be 16 years or older, um, but that's 16 years all the way up uh, to master's athletes. Um, so we serve competitive and high performance athletes. And so obviously competitive does re reach into grassroots. This isn't just national and Olympic athletes, professional athletes. This is a wide range of different performers. We also have recently expanded to performing artists. So dancers, musicians, as well as coaches and support staff. So that means as an athletic therapist or um, a sport doctor, you could be referring yourself to the center or referring one of your peers or colleagues, because we understand that mental health is also a part of the IST's world in the sport domain. Um, and in order to qualify for CCMHS services, you do have to be experiencing some kind of mental health challenge. We're not just servicing mental performance needs. We do understand and have people that come to us for these things, but usually we'll refer to our external network of mental performance consultants rather than bringing in them into the center because we do mental illness assessment and we deal with functional impairments to mental health. So our team is really what makes us unique and I guess quite desirable in the sport world. Um, a lot of athletes end up not seeking care and not continuing with care because they don't feel a connection to the practitioner that they've sought help from. They don't feel understood as an athlete. And so our care team is sport-centered first and foremost. We're comprised of 21 different mental health practitioners with backgrounds in sport and specialized competency in sport. So right now we have seven registered or clinical psychologists eight counselors, three specific mental performance consultants, and one family physician who really works uh, just collaboratively with us in the background. Notably though, 12 of our team members are professional members of the Canadian Sports Psychology Association and nine have dual competencies. So this means nine of our practitioners are not only qualified in their mental health domain, but also as a sports psychology consultant working in the field of applied sports psych. We also have a care coordinator, that's me actually, who's a centralized point of contact for everybody that comes into the center. So I meet with every single client that's referred to the center and I become a neutral point of contact for them so that we can make sure they're getting a team that has a good fit for them. They have a practitioner that they're actually getting along with and that they have a con continuity of care, that they're not lost to the system, which is what we see with a lot of athletes who end up dropping out of care. 
So our model has seven components that together make it unique, not only in Canada, but actually internationally as well. So Poppy's talked a lot about uh, our practitioners having that sport background, and that's what makes the care sport informed, and that they reside uh, across the country. And we've done that to get around jurisdictional uh, barriers to practice and to ensure that um, we can offer in-person care when it's necessary. Like I said, we work in person and virtually, although with COVID we've gone completely online and actually athletes seem to prefer that because they can be stretching or uh, fueling and recovering and seeing their mental health practitioner. Poppy is our fantastic centralized care coordinator. So she's um, a neutral and safe touch point and she guides uh, clients through the care process and also helps our practitioners uh, adhere to our model, our procedures and our policies. And then our practitioners take a collaborative approach. So there's always two practitioners on everybody's care team, a lead and a support. And in practice, the amount of collaboration really varies uh, from case to case, from a client never seeing their support practitioner to those practitioners um, collaborating in the background. Uh, so the support is really acting as a sounding board for the lead. And then we've had cases where clients see up to three of our practitioners because they're experiencing complex symptoms, they're um, at a distance from their practitioners, and so we need to make sure that they're not only kept safe, but also um, enhancing their mental health and their sport performance. And the way that we connect all our practitioners and have them communicate is through electronic health records that are secure. Uh, only the practitioners on a client's team will have access to that client's information. And in that way, our practitioners who are situated far from each other can communicate and stay up to date on client happenings. And then we also use a fee for service model. So the intake with Poppy um, is free of charge. We absorb that, absorb that cost at the center. Uh, and then following that, each care session does carry a cost that's commiserate with what you'd find in the private and public sectors. So I think you guys might be getting into this a little bit later, but we never like to talk about the center and not explain when you should refer just to have a little bit of understanding. Um, so as a, you know, as ATs, you spend a lot of time with athletes. And so you're in a really great position to notice persistent and significant deviations from their baseline normal. When we say persistent, we're talking about two weeks or more. Uh, it's usually your like flag, like, okay, I need to follow up on this. And significant, when we're talking about significant uh, deviation, we're talking about symptoms that are impairing somebody's ability to experience positive emotions more often than negative, performs their roles and responsibilities, whether that be in the sport realm, in school, in their workspace. Um, it's preventing them from having healthy relationships with other people and contributing meaningfully for their, to their community. And so some things that you're looking for are those prolonged changes in thoughts, which athletes may verbalize to you, um, their self-talk, their behaviors, their appearance, and their feelings. Um, so referral is very easy, um, and we've done this on purpose because we want to make ourselves as accessible as possible. So you just have to visit our website. Um, you can use the slash refer, but the referral buttons pop up on our homepage as well. Um, a really unique factor of the center is that there's no physician referral necessary to get an athlete or any kind of support team member into CCMHS for an intake. You can either refer yourself or you can refer an athlete or a colleague. Um, you have to refer that person with their consent because I get in touch with them directly. So we try not to spring the care on anybody. Um, you've got to have a conversation with them first. And we do ask you to acknowledge that the athlete or the uh, practitioner has consented. Um, you can also get in touch by email or phone. And these are direct communications with me. Um, and this just allows us to have a longer conversation. If you have specific concerns about someone or about yourself and you're not sure how the care process works, I'm happy to have a longer conversation. At some point, that electronic referral form does have to go through. It's quite simple and it's just a part of our way of tracking to make sure we don't uh, lose anybody along the way. Once the referral comes in, um, we book an intake session with the client. That happens with me and it happens at no charge. It's comprised of filling out an intake questionnaire that screens for a bunch of different mental health indices. 
Um, and it also comprises a conversation with me. That conversation can be anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour, depending on how much the client wants to share. Um, but I actually use those two pieces of information in order to refer to the best possible fit of a care team for that person. We use a really holistic approach in that I'm trying to fit, find a fit of practitioner for the person, for the athlete, and for the core concerns that are flagged on the intake questionnaire and verbalized by the person coming into the center. Um, once I've actually made a referral to a care team, the care delivery starts usually between five and seven days after the referral is made. So we have no wait time at this point. And I know that's a major selling point for a lot of athletes who are waiting months, if not a year, to access care sometimes. Um, and care delivery can last anywhere from one session to um, a full year. We work in blocks of sessions, so we check in every four sessions, but we don't have a limit on how long somebody can see their practitioner. And once someone exits from CCMHS, their file is put as inactive, but they're welcome to revisit us at any time if they need to reaccess care. So um, we aren't going to take questions because it may, it may derail this whole presentation, but here are some frequently asked questions. Um, do we work with performance concerns? Poppy's addressed this, um, but we have a lot of people coming and thinking that we're just um, offering performance services. Uh, we will always, if anybody's ever ineligible and, and not having a mental health challenge would make somebody ineligible, we always make a referral to the community. Um, so in this case, it would be to our network of mental performance consultants. Um, sometimes we have parents asking if their 15 year old can come through the center. Uh, we have been known to bend the rules, but that's really about our practitioner team uh, and their competencies and comfort. So we don't service younger athletes at this time because we don't have enough uh, practitioners on staff with the training in child psychology and the care of younger individuals. So uh, we want to make sure everybody's safe and within their scope of practice. Um, but if, you know, we get a referral for a 15, almost 16 year old and our team feels comfortable, we will take that person on. Can we help if somebody is suicidal? Unfortunately, we're not. So we're not a crisis center. We don't have the capacity to respond to crisis uh, events for people who have not are not already in our system. Of course, if somebody's already matched with a practitioner, they will be available um, if that client is having um, crisis or distress. Um, but we'll always direct people if you have a suicidal um, athlete, coach, or member of support staff. Uh, we'll direct them to 911 or the nearest emergency room. So with that, um, oh, shoot, sorry. The next slide just has our contact information. We'll also throw it in the chat. You can connect with us online as well. We're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, and uh, you can feel free to email Poppy or I anytime if you have questions. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. And, and a lot of lead in there to some of the things that we're going to touch on. So Krista and Poppy, really appreciate you taking the time and all the work that you're doing at CCMHS. Um, I'm sure we'll have plenty of questions to get your way afterwards and, and lots of referral points as well with the practitioners we have in the room. So uh, thank you once again. And, and if you need to head out, uh, we appreciate it as always. And, and we'll talk to you very soon. Um, we're going to jump back into our presentation here. And as an athletic therapist and a, um, somebody who works in the performance space, all of these areas are areas where we can do just what we've started talking about. And that's starting with a conversation. So we're everywhere as practitioners in locker rooms, in the weight room, in the training room, or out on the field and the sidelines. And we're privy to a lot of that information or a lot of conversations and hearing a lot of the things um, that are happening both in the locker room or in the therapy room, but also outside because we're there and we're accessible. And um, I think both Poppy and Krista mentioned that connection that athletes feel to their practitioners. So this is an area that as a practitioner myself, I feel um, we can always use a whole lot more support in terms of having resources and referees um, within this space so that we can help in areas or get connected to people who have expertise in the areas that we may not be quite as comfortable. And so with that, uh, we're going to send this over, Jens, I'm going to send this over to you and, uh, and let's jump into our presentation. Awesome. Thank you so much, James. Uh, thank you, ladies. That was very uh, uh, insightful and uh, educational. And uh, I, I think it's fantastic what you guys are doing. And 
uh, I will definitely refer some of my clients to you when and if needed. Thank you so much. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, my background is professional hockey and uh, during my career and throughout my presentation, I will refer back to my, my personal experiences uh, throughout my career. And uh, I wanna start with, uh, unfortunately, one of the entry drugs for a lot of uh, addictions in sport, which is performance enhancing drugs. Uh, my personal, my first personal experience with performance enhancing drugs was uh, when I was 27 years old. I just got traded just before Christmas and uh, our team doctor at the time was the former um, national doctor, a doctor of the Russian national team. So, you know, during the Cold War, we always had suspicions that there were things going on that were not legit. And uh, I was sitting in a dressing room for my first game, which accidentally or incidentally happened to be in my hometown. So I wanted to look good in front of my, uh, my family and friends. And uh, our team doctor walked around the dressing room and stopped in front of everybody and, and uh, every individual and held out a, a handful of pills. And I was like, well, this is odd. Even though we had the suspicion whenever we played against this team, the players, uh, their facial expression, like big eyes, and they were always very aggressive. So there was the suspicion that something was going on. So anyways, he came around and he was standing in front of me and he held his hand out and he said, take this. And I'm like, uh, what is this? And he said, just don't ask, take them. And I refused to take them and he wouldn't go away. So I finally took them, put them in my mouth and uh, threw them under my, my seat as he walked away and uh, after the game, I went up to him and I asked him to never do that again or uh, I will punch him in the face. Um, I had a conversation with him after, he would not share with me what these pills were for and uh, uh, what the ingredients were. So uh, my teammates kept using them and unfortunately uh, a couple of my teammates went down the road of addiction and it started with performance enhancing drugs uh, if you want to do the next slide. And uh, unfortunately for a lot of athletes, this is where it leads. Uh, street drugs, especially cocaine, are very popular amongst athletes. Uh, of course, we can generalize, but it's uh, for a lot of guys and uh, athletes, that's the go-to drug. Unfortunately, I had the experience and uh, I got introduced to cocaine and it was very innocent when it started, if you can say that, but uh, I went to a team party at one of my teammates and uh, I was there with my girlfriend and he came to me and he pulled me away and he asked me to, to help him translate a letter. He took me in the bedroom and I walked in there and there was a mirror with 10 lines of coke. And I'm like, what is this? And he's like, well, you're one of us. So have some. And I'm like, I'm not, I, I'm not interested. He says, you're not leaving here until you take a line. And uh, of course, you know, I didn't want to be a loser, loser. Uh, so I had, had a couple of lines and unfortunately it didn't stop there. Uh, I got to a point where I used it on a daily base and during the season and uh, I, I thought it was cool and I, I felt great uh, until it was about three weeks before the playoffs when I woke up in the morning and my heart was going a million miles an hour. I thought I was a ha uh, having a heart attack. So I got in the car, rushed to the hospital and uh, the doctor said, um, we have to run some tests. We don't know what's wrong. I didn't want to... Uh, come out with my lifestyle. I didn't want to confess to the doctor because he was also our team doctor and I don't know if I could trust him. Uh, my fear was that if I uh, confine in him that I'm going to lose my job. So I was in the hospital for a week and all they said was, uh, you're fine. You just have to change your lifestyle or you're not going to live to see 40. And there was definitely a wake up call for me. Um, one of my best friends wasn't as lucky. He uh, died at 47 with a massive heart attack and that was due to drug abuse. He was also a professional hockey player in Germany and uh, um, the bottom line is that people knew that we were abusing drugs 
but nobody came to us and, and talked to us about it. And even after I had my episode, I did not feel comfortable or safe to confine in either the manager, the coach, or the, the trainers or the doctors, because I was afraid that if I confined in them, that they would go and, uh, and rat me out. And this is where we have a huge responsibility when we feel that there is something off, like the ladies from CCMHS just said, we have to look for the signs and we have to have a, a trusting relationship with the athletes we're working with because they are depending on us to take care of them. At the end of the day, it's their decision, but when we see the red flags, we have to be able to find the conversation be able to listen and be a safe place for our athletes, right? Yeah, no, Jens, I'll just jump in quickly from the practitioner side in terms yes. of the daily use uh, in the clinic and, and, and in the sports realm, uh, in the gym, the therapy room, uh, on the bench, uh, that duty of care comes first and foremost. And I think the older that I get and the more time that I spend understanding uh, that duty of care and really getting comfortable with that, housing those difficult conversations is where a lot of the solution begins. And so as part of our role and as part of this education process and opening the conversation with CCMHS, with yourself and, and with Mike coming up, um, we have a duty as well to understand that we are a part of that conversation. And if we're not having the conversation, we then get um, uh, rolled up into being part of the problem instead of part of the solution. And so you've touched on some personal experience and I think that's amazing. And I really appreciate your, uh, your willingness to share because I think those things go a long way as well. Uh, and they also allow you to connect, I'm sure, with the people that you deal with on a regular basis now. And uh, I just want to reiterate that for no matter what stage of your career that you're in or what realm that you work in, um, beginning to understand that those tough conversations need to be had when you're hearing things in the locker room or seeing things or seeing those behavior changes or noticing thoughts or, uh, or athletes are sharing this with you, but they're not comfortable. They, they don't want you to tell anybody else. We have a duty of care to the long-term health of every single person that we come in contact with in our profession. So as a professional, if you're not comfortable or I'm not comfortable having that conversation with the athlete, there are people out there that can have those conversations um, and help us to have those conversations to facilitate that a little bit more. So great shares. Let's, let's keep going. Thanks. Thank you, James. Um, James uh, mentioned earlier the TSN documentary, uh, the problem of pain. The problem of pain is a huge issue uh, for athletes on any level, but especially on the professional level. And if you haven't watched it, uh, I would highly recommend that you watch it. Uh, it's about three former NHL players, um, Ryan Kessler, Kyle Quincy, and Zena Konopka. And uh, I know I m briefly met the latter two and uh, I, I feel for them. And I've gone through similar things, you know, when you're a professional athlete, especially in a team sport, you don't want to be injured. Nobody wants to be injured, but especially when you're in a team setting, you don't want to let your team down, but you also don't want to lose your spot on the team. So an athlete's health should always be a practitioner's number one priority. And, uh, Unfortunately, that's not always the case because the, the practitioners have pressure, especially in the professional setting, from the management, from the owners, from the sponsors to have the top players on the ice. So Ryan Kessler said something very uh, significant on, in the, during this uh, documentary, and that was, I would have played with one leg. And that speaks volume and it speaks for pretty much every team, professional team athlete out there. I was the same. I had a flake fracture in my knee. My knee was like a balloon. Uh, our team doctor couldn't go on the road. I, I went on the road. They uh, drained my knee uh, when we got to the rink. They actually had a doctor there. I had three injections so I can play. So I didn't want to say no because 
I didn't want to let my team down, but I also didn't want to, I was a goalie. I didn't want to lose my starting position. So this is where practitioners have to put a foot down and educate the athlete about the long-term effects that these medications not might have, but will have on their health. Um, when an athlete is injured, at the end of the day, it's his decision to say, I'm playing, whether you give me a, a painkiller or not, or you give me an injection or not, but it's the, the practitioner's decision to say, I'm not doing this because I don't want to be responsible for your long-term effects. In Ryan Kessler's uh, um, case, there is blame, but we also have to put up a mirror and say, okay, it was my decision to take the injection all over and over and over again so I can perform but we have to find a balance and we have to build. And this is not when someone is injured or someone is suffering from addiction. We as practitioners or coaches or uh, therapists, we have to build a foundation with these athletes so they know they have a trusting source where they can go and say, listen, I need your help. I need your guidance and I need your advice. And this is one of the utmost important uh, jobs that we have to build a trusting relationship so the athletes know whether it's on a professional level or amateur level or Olympic level uh, or minor level that they can come to us and can find and, and have that trust where they know if I spill the beans, I know I'm not gonna be ratted out. Yeah. So, so some great points. And I think that accountability piece is massive, right? Like as a practitioner who's in the room or on the training floor or in the clinic or on the bench, we definitely have a duty of care to educate. But if there are areas that we're not comfortable educating in, or we feel like that trust bond is going to be broken, we then have a duty of care to get informed or a duty of care to bring somebody in who can inform in those areas and start to build that trust outward. I think that two-way trust between athlete and, and practitioner is absolutely massive. I've been in the professional space. I understand these conversations are difficult. Uh, I understand what's actually happening, uh, not everywhere, um, but that educational piece is massive. And I don't think there was a lot of that time spent in that, in that documentary. And not that we're going to talk about that documentary one way or the other all night long, but uh, there is some accountability on the athlete if they're an adult and they're making these decisions, but there's definitely some accountability on our side too. So there's a happy medium and you touched on that as well. And I think these are great points just to consider if, and when I'm going to have these conversations, do I have the support of the athletes, the trust of the athletes, and then do I have the support of the medical staff and the right people? CCMHS as a center is one of only a few in the world, like globally, that have access to um, athletes, like in the sports space specifically. And so if you didn't know about it before, I mean, you've already got your money's worth. You know about this center. And, and, and uh, I think just having those conversations with those professionals or finding professionals in your local area that can support you as a practitioner and therefore support your athletes a little bit better, that's massive. That's a huge win for all of us. Go ahead, Mike. Absolutely. I think you can flip Thank it. Thank you, James. Yeah. So I'm not going to go into too deep of a detail uh, with this slide because uh, Mike is going to uh, talk about this and uh, go a little more in depth. And also the ladies of uh, CCMHS talked about it uh, briefly. But, um, you know, drug abuse, whether it's prescription drugs or street drugs, generally at some point will lead to uh, anxiety and depression. And uh, uh, unfortunately, I personally suffer from, from uh, anxiety and I've been suffering from anxiety since I was six years old, never have been diagnosed until I was 43 for years and years and years I was labeled hypochondriac and during my career I had no one to to go to and share what was going on for me that I have these panic attacks and uh, when I shared it, it they sent me to the doctors and the doctor said he has nothing he's totally fine so um, depression and anxiety is something that is very very common in athletes whether it's performance anxiety uh, or 
uh, stress disorder, uh, depression, because number of reasons. Again, uh, Mike will go into that in deeper uh, uh, deeper details. But here again, it's so important that we know how to handle someone who is dealing with uh, mental challenges, whether it's illness or um, whether it's depression, whether it's anxiety. But again, Mike will uh, touch on that uh, a little later. Yeah, and I think there's a number of professionals in here who are in the professional sports space, as well as the amateur space, collegiate level, university, and people will be picking this up uh, hopefully afterwards as well. And I think one thing that I've always talked to students about and talked to my former self about and my future self about is uh, knowing our athletes and patients. So doing more than associating them with the injury they are when they walk in, if it's somebody you're seeing on a one-off. Um, understanding who they are. And, and, and if you're there on a daily basis, you understand which shoe they tie first. You understand what a handshake looks and feels like on a good day and on a not so good day. And Poppy touched on it, Krista touched on it, and you've touched on it. And I just want to reiterate that as well is like how we know our athletes and, and what we know about them goes a long way in a building the trust but be also helping us recognize signs and symptoms, not only of injury that shows up physically, but on that mental side, right? And in the addiction side of things as well. So um, I just, I, I keep jumping in. I don't mean to interrupt, but all of this is so real mm -hmm. in this space that uh, I really appreciate this and, and it's great information. I appreciate that you are actually jumping in and uh, put it in your terms. And I, uh, I'm very grateful for that. So, Moving forward, uh, we all know, you know, the pressure on athletes, especially again on the professional level is immense and it grows on a daily basis, whether it's through social media, uh, mainstream media, coaches, managers, owners, fans, family, uh, and the pressure that we put on ourselves to perform. Um, it gets overwhelming and a lot of uh, athletes are suffering from performance anxiety and depression. And it's really, really important that they have an outlet and have someone to turn to uh, when they're struggling. It's, um, I'm sorry, I have a cat meow. That's very distracting. Um, sorry about that. Um, for me, Again, I go back to my career, uh, it was ages ago and we didn't have any uh, uh, mental coaches. We didn't have any psychotherapists or psychologists on the, on the roster. And I dealt with my anxiety and my depression. Um, I grew up in a very abusive home. My father was an abusive uh, alcoholic and uh, uh, that's why I started suffering from anxiety when I was six years old. And uh, it was, it was devastating for me not to know what was going on for me because I had no idea what I was suffering from. I just felt like I was not normal. And we now have the tools, the knowledge, the education to help these athletes. And again, it's all about building relationships. If you're a, a team practitioner and you work with 30 uh, players or athletes, or 50 athletes. Yeah, it's very time consuming to build relationship with each and every one of them, but it's necessary. And it's the time we have to take and that's the responsibility we have to take. And the greatest gift that we can give them is us and is an ear to listen. And sometimes these athletes are not looking for advice. They just want someone as a sounding board. And we have the ability, we have the capacity to be there for them. And for that, I'm very grateful. I love what I'm doing and I love being around athletes and I love helping them be more successful, but also live happier lives. Our main mandate, and we all in some shape or form gave a, a code of ethics and that is protecting our athletes. And we have to question and ask ourselves, are we doing everything and anything in our mind to actually protect our athletes? You know, when we, when we watch a documentary like uh, The Problem of Pain, 
it makes me cringe and it makes me feel horrible, not because I went through similar stuff, but because they're going through it and they're suffering way worse than I, than I am suffering. But there are other ways in reliving in 2020 and there's alternative medicine. There's different ways to treat uh, athletes without pumping them with chemicals. And this, is, this should be our mandate to find ways to treat our athletes so they are healthier. And once they retire, they still have a great life and not suffering from the, the long-term effects from the medication that they have been uh, fed over their, their careers. And again, you know, I wanna wrap this up and I wanna say thank you again for listening, for giving me the chance to, to speak in front of you and to be part of this. Uh, great group and I want to ask you to do the best I know you are, you are doing the best but do better and and take care of the athletes that are in your care again thank you so much yeah, th thanks, Jens. And Mike, just before we jump over to you, I, I just wanted to reiterate that. And, and uh, it was amazing to hear that CCMHS takes on practitioners as well. So we know that we're a part of this. And, um, and, and I think that's an amazing piece as well, because we can support one another through these conversations as well. But one point that I like to drive home as often as possible is that we do not have to be everything to everybody. We don't have to be the expert in these fields but we should do our very best uh, to know who is, to know somebody who is an expert in the areas that we're not strong in. And that's really where I've come to in my career is building out a model of integrative care for the athlete. If I can handle it, I have no problem referring outward to a sports chiropractor, a physiotherapist, a mental health practitioner. But I have to have those as quote unquote tools in my toolbox, referees, references that we can network with to make this a more holistic approach. It's not that it's all doom and gloom in the pro sports space, but uh, outside of the pro sports space, resources can be tough. So when resources are tough, we rely on one another to navigate. If you're in rural Ontario, you may not have experts, but COVID's taught us a lot of things and remote work helps. It definitely helps. And we just heard from experts at the beginning. We've heard from Jens, who's also moved to the online space. Uh, and we'll hear now from Mike Stroh. So Mike, uh, appreciate you being on man, take over and run with this. And uh, I'll do my best not to interrupt you. No, please do if, if the impulse uh, you know, arises. So I think some of the things I was going to cover were covered already. So I'll skip over those, but I just want to draw our attention to this little map here or this little diagram that my colleagues and I have kind of slowly put together. And this is about kind of knowing what's happening inside of you so that you can be a, in, of service to the people that you're caring for or working with. So we talked about knowing the signs, you know, it's it's pretty, I mean, as a human being, you are wired to be able to see suffering in another human being. You know, beyond, you know, the ins and outs and the intricacies of, of serving that person over a long period of time, of course, it takes a lot of practice and, and skills and et cetera. But as was mentioned, that's not really your job as practitioners in these situations. So just being a human, recognizing that your athletes are human goes a, a very, very long way in developing sort of a sense of compassion and empathy for what they're going through. So knowing the signs, I think one thing I'll reiterate is that we're all human. We all suffer. We all feel sad. We all get angry. We all feel, you know, a, a whole range of emotions. But as um, Poppy was saying, or one of them was one of the, the women from CCMHS was that when these things become prolonged and they are distinctly different from that person's normal behavior. So this is another thing Jens was saying about developing, I think James too, developing relationships with your athletes so that you actually know who they are as a human will go a long way in your ability to start identifying, hey, person A, you know, maybe she's behaving in a way that is not appropriate to the scenario that's going on right now huh and and so if you look at the model going to this idea of self-awareness it's kind of 
knowing is, are you capable of providing support to this person? Or are you aware that, you know what, this is outside of my scope of practice and I need to ask for help. And so the next one here, boundaries is oftentimes we may approach somebody and ask them if they kind of want our help and they give us a response that we don't like. Uh, a lot of times people just ignore that and carry on anyways. So it's just really important to respect people's boundaries, know where your boundaries start and end, and then you know, learning how to communicate that to other people is kind of what I'll get into. Um, this quickly, which I think can help to clarify, you see this little model here. This is a really helpful way to distinguish between mental health and mental illness. The Y axis here is mental health. Every single human being has, you know, you have a brain, you have mental health. And on any given day, people's mental health go up and down this spectrum. The X axis here is mental illness. So to be diagnosed with a mental illness, you need to see a psychiatrist or a clinical psychologist. You need to meet a whole bunch of criteria. But what this really model shows us is that we can have a mental illness and still have good mental health. You can have no mental illness and have bad mental health. You can have no, or you can have mental illness and bad mental health. And so you can kind of see how this works on any given day. And for people that have a diagnosis, like myself or like my brother or like many other people in the world, generally speaking, for us, it takes a little more work to find balance and to kind of pick ourselves back up if we're having a difficult time. So I think it's just helpful to identify the difference between these two things, because in this push for mental health awareness, these lines are getting blurred and not discussed accurately. Um, so I wanted to touch on that. This, that's, 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 an, that's an amazing slide, Mike. If you could just jump back to that one yeah. just for a second, because I think that one, uh, yeah. that one deserves uh, a whole lot of attention, right? And so uh, that's a difference between being anxious and having anxiety right? Like these are two different things. And so when we're looking at mental illness, mental illness and, and mental health, I think that differentiation and looking at this on a very simplistic format, like this does it for me, it's a great visual. And, uh, and I think it's one that, uh, that we can all sort of post uh, and start to talk about at least in, in clinics and in, in, you know, the strength and conditioning space or the pro space, and, and everybody can relate to that. You can see what fits sort of within those boxes and where that overlap happens. And I love that idea of, um, or the visual for me, at least of, of that um, continuum right? Moving up and down that spectrum on a daily basis, knowing that mental, knowing that mental health is a thing that we all house. It's not a thing that you have if you're going badly. And I think that's huge in distinguishing that for people. Um, and, and for myself, like I just kind of got a little bit excited about that when I get goosebumps a little bit with that one, because it's a, it's a bit of an aha moment, you know, and, and, and I think that's, um, that's fantastic. So keep going. I, I promised I would only interrupt when necessary. So let's call it necessary. <laughs> All right. I love it. I love it. No. And I, I was just, I have like a, almost a paper on my website and a video about this that goes into much more detail. So if anyone is interested after, um, happy to share that. So this was discussed, like the boundary between the two, what I think is not discussed or well understood is addiction. Um, what does addiction even mean? The medical community has, has very little consensus on this. I take the approach of um, that it's sort of a three-pronged thing. It's almost like a spiritual thing. It's a psychological thing, and it's a physical thing. I, I am very fond of Dr. Gaber Mate, who's a Canadian doctor. He's an addiction specialist. He's world-renowned. And his kind of definition is that addiction is a manifestation of any behavior that a person craves finds temporary relief or pleasure in, but suffers negative consequences as a result of that behavior. And no matter how bad those negative consequences are, they can't stop. So personally, I was convicted of trafficking marijuana in high school. I was a very promising golfer. Uh, drugs just destroyed all of that for me. And no matter what happened, I could not step out of this sort of desire to be high because I didn't know how to deal with anything. So another simple way is drugs are not the problem. Drugs are the solution. Okay. The 
the problem is the underlying mental health concerns and without a, another solution we turn to drugs or we'll turn to anything that we can get our hands on to make that pain go away so it you know things when people are not willing to accept that they have a, a substance use problem denial is a big thing don't even notice i am lying <laughs> it's a great acronym um and people get really defensive so you know you may see something here's a great example if i'm in the thrills the, the i guess the grasp of my addiction if somebody tells me something that i know is good for me i'm going to do the opposite on purpose just to spite them and then i'm going to blame them for telling me to do what i assume they told me to do so that's just kind of an example of like how this the illness really like destroys people and i'm i'm a good example of that in my previous life so another underlying motivation of addictive behavior or what drives addiction or is this idea of negative core beliefs and this is sort of a more a psychological perspective but we have negative core beliefs about ourself so if i'm an athlete you know i'm not good enough my career is going to be over i suck everything's my fault i'm a bad person if i don't succeed in sports nobody's going to love me and my world's going to come crashing down I may also have negative core beliefs about other people. So I can't trust the coach. I can't trust the trainer. I can't trust my teammates. I can't trust my family. If I tell everybody the, the truth of my situation, no one's going to love me. And so, of course, I mean, when people are kind of, you know, almost like, uh, what's the word, like um, lulled into that, or it's not the word I'm looking for. But anyway, when people are stuck in that place, it's no wonder that they isolate and hide and lie and deny and et cetera. So, you know, it's really important. And it's been the theme in some sense is our, our willingness to listen openly, kindly, compassionately, and not try to fix people. So that is a tricky thing to balance when you are working. And, you know, in some situations, it's not your responsibility to deal with this person's problems so that goes back to the boundaries and understanding you know what is my responsibility what is not and how can i help here but not you know it's the idea of putting the the mask on first when the plane's going down so you got to take care of yourself you have to be weary of putting yourself in in bad situations with simultaneously holding your ethical you know need or role to be of service, you know, to the people you're helping. So this is a, a quick way to just understand what goes on inside the mind of a human being. We on the outside of this little diagram, you see situations and experience. So if I'm an athlete, and I get injured, that's sort of an experience that triggers this little thought process in here. So my thoughts start to run, my emotions start to get intense, I have body sensations, I have an impulse and then I choose a behavior. And so this is really just to expand your kind of capacity to understand how things work in people so that you can just notice it. And it's really important to notice it in yourself. That goes back to this self-awareness part of the model. It's like, I need to know how my thoughts lead to my feelings, lead to my behaviors so that I can communicate that to my athletes or to the people I'm being of service to. And when you are able to communicate these things authentically and sincerely to your athletes, just as on a daily basis, you know, today I'm, I feel like shit because my kid did X and I'm thinking I'm the worst parent in the world or I'm da, 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 da. If you can be honest like that, then that person is going to be so much more likely to be honest back to you when they're having a hard time. I think that's that's absolutely crucial, you know, and then to hear it from you in that space and, and to sort of take that on and, and to understand that, again, like everything you've highlighted and has been highlighted to this point is we don't have to be anything, but if we're going to be one thing, it's it's a listener, you know, but opening that by being an open listener, non-judgmental right and just and just and and being uh which is which is incredibly hard to do and and maybe we'll we'll touch on that or you touch on that or we can get to that in the q a at the end because i have about 15 questions lined up on my own already for you so anyway 
let's keep rolling. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'll skip this because this has been this point's been sort of crammed down everybody's mind tonight. So these are the four domains in a clinical setting: thoughts, behaviors, sensations, and emotions. Okay, that's kind of like how people get assessed for how they're functioning. I want to try to play this. And I'm going to just see what happens here. No, it's not working. Can anyone hear this? James, can you hear that? No, I can't hear it, but you can see it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Anyhow, that video is an example, uh, kind of what I mentioned before. As human beings, we are wired for empathy and compassion. We don't need words to communicate. Okay. In some sense, the idea behind that is communication is pre-verbal. Goes back to this idea, you can be of, of incredible service to other people just by being yourself and by communicating to these people as a human being, not as like some assumed identity that you're embodying and, and projecting onto them and, oh, that person is an athlete, so they're not going to just be a human. And that goes such an incredibly long way. So how you may start to communicate these things, and there's just a couple more slides and I'll, I'll wrap it up. But to take that point further that James was just saying, this is very, very helpful, at least for me. And I think it can be for you. So you can think about this personally and also when in communication with somebody else. Excuse me. So if you're trying to model, here's another thing is, is modeling the behavior of openness and vulnerability, that's going to encourage other people to do the same. And you can start to do that by separating thoughts from feelings in your communication. You know, everyone says, oh, I feel that, you know, the world is unfair, or I feel that X, but that's not a feeling, that's a thought. So when we want to say, I think the world is unfair, and it makes me angry. So you could say to an athlete, I think that referee is an idiot and made a bad call. And I'm really frustrated about that. Um, you could say, I think that whatever it is, but when you start to separate those two things, it makes a huge difference in your communication skills in a psychological perspective, right? Like you don't have to be so fanatical about it in, in common discourse, but this is a huge one. And also, in your private life, if you have a partner or a spouse or a friends, whatever, try this out and see, maybe you already do it, but try this out and see how they respond to that. So we talked a lot about this idea of being a compassionate presence. So there's a simple idea between hearing and listening. Okay, I define it as this is hearing. Oh yeah, really, yeah. No, you're having a hard time at home. Your mom's sick, this, that. Okay, what was that? Sorry, I didn't hear it. Oh, sorry, you know. Versus listening is you are present with the person and you are there for them. And they know instantly whether you're being sincere or not. It's okay if you can't listen to. If you know that somebody's trying to talk to you about something important and you don't have the capacity to take it in, you tell them that. You go back to the previous slide. I think that you really need my attention right now. I feel bad that I can't give it to you. So can we set up another time for to talk about this? Something like that. It goes a really long way. So that kind of embodies this last slide of validation. I see that you are having a hard time. To me, I statements, I'm glad I remember that, I statements are huge, okay? I think you're having a bad, hard time, or to me, it looks like you're having a, bad, a hard time. Validating. So, you know, when you're in a shitty mood and somebody kind of just validates the fact that you're in a bad mood and you have every right to be in a bad mood, it actually soothes us as an organism. Like our nervous system is soothed when we get kind of cared for in that way. Acceptance is not wanting this person or yourself to, you know, when you start judging yourself for feeling bad, oh, I'm an idiot for feeling bad, I'm a loser, why do I feel this way, blah, 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 or judging another person. So you want to be able to accept the emotion for what it is, and the presence is being here with the person, giving them your eye contact. I, I can't remember somebody in this presentation said it, but our attention 
is the biggest gift that we can give to anybody in any domain of life. So particularly when somebody is suffering and struggling with something difficult. So this is just, these are all just little, you know, seeds, planting them, you know, in your minds. The, this is lifelong practice. This is stuff that humans have not mastered in any possible way whatsoever, but we're starting to figure out some of the pathways. Um, and so I hope, I hope that's all helpful. And uh, let's, let's get into some chats. Yeah, let's, let's, let's jump over. So if anybody has any questions, just uh, uh, maybe type them in the box or you can put up your virtual hand and I'll unmute you uh, and you can talk this through. But just before we do that, um, guys, this is fantastic. And, and we had run through this a couple of times and we had talked about our purpose and what we're trying to do. And um, we're really just trying to open the door here to have a conversation and to listen to one another and see what's out there in terms of where we're suffering, what, what walls we're running into. You know, and, and um, I just keep going back in my mind to the podcast session that I had with Brady Leavold. Brady has his own podcast as well, where he goes through his story, but it was just so raw and so real. Uh, and obviously will be a lifelong battle with addiction, right? Addiction and mental health issues and mental illness, maybe, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, those issues will be lifelong for Brady. And I encourage everybody out there who's willing to go and listen to um to his story, whether it's through my podcast or his own, it's irrelevant, but to listen to that and to see where he's attempting to take things now by using his recovery and his addiction as a source of strength to support other people going through those same things. I wrote down something at the beginning, I think when Krista was saying, and each one of you has, has touched on that uh, since, um, everything starts with an idea. It's built, uh, strength is built with conversation and then from those conversations, we solidify it with community. And I think moving through that stage and starting here as a talking point, uh, not in response to anything, but simply to open the door to know that there are people out there that can help us and to have the conversations with so that we can begin to have these conversations. Oh, about. Megan, she did it. All right. She got it. Yeah, Sorry, she got Megan it was out. asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Oh, oh, look at the, oh, the great. dictation. Oh. We should have had that up. I can't believe we didn't figure that's mm -hmm. terrible. Yeah, no, that's no, that's fantastic. That's so cool. But uh let me let me get uh um okay, Megan, Megan Megan unmuted here for a second. I hope that's how you pronounce it. Hi, yep, it's Megan. Go for it. Yeah. Okay, awesome. <laughs> um, a lot of great stuff. Thank you so much, everyone. Um I just wanted to put out there, I've been doing a lot of training for my institution. I work at a uh, university. Um, there's uh, some great training through the Mental Health Commission of Canada um, that also um, has uh, a couple of courses. There's one called the Working Mind for employees. There's one for managers. They all have one called the Working Mind Sport. It's geared towards coaches and athletes, but um, I found I personally have gotten a lot out of it. It's um, based on um, uh, it's based on bringing things down out of medical speak and making it really accessible to um, athletes, the general public, um, coaches. There's also some great graphics. I really liked your graph. They they do things on a, a continuum with like the green to the yellow to the orange to the red. I'm sure some of you are familiar with this. Um, it it also really fits in well with everything that's been talked about here where it's really focused on um, supporting yourself as a practitioner, supporting yourself as a coworker, as a teammate, and how to have those tough conversations without having to be an expert. So um, I just want to put that out there to people. The Mental Health Commission of Canada has some really great resources. Um, I'm a trainer myself, so I train those in my institution. Um, and it's, it's really in line with all the excellent information here. Where, where are you, Megan, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, I'm at McEwen University in Edmonton. Okay. Yeah, no. Okay, great. Thank you for joining us. And, and those are great shares. And we'll, we'll make sure that we, uh, we dictate this and, and get this out as well. And, and hopefully through the recording, uh, maybe what we'll try to do is get this recording out to everybody or at least accessible in a membership area. We got to look into all those details afterwards, but um, appreciate the share. Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. And I'll, I'll throw the link awesome. down in my, in the chat here. It's a really great resource. Fantastic. Awesome. 
Um, yeah, so we'll open it up. If anybody wants to type it, type into the uh, the chat box, please feel free to do so. We have uh, you know we have plenty of time here for questions. If there's stuff you want to go back to, slides you want to go back to, um, personal experiences, or how to reach uh, how to reach out to somebody, or how to begin a conversation, uh, Jens and Mike are are, are certainly experts uh, in those domains. And um, I don't know for for me as a practitioner, I I think I just no, I don't think I did. Has a question. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Great. I just made six pages of notes, so I'll I'll, I'll have a few more for you here in a second. So we'll. Right, we'll will I? Uh, oh, yeah. Hey, thanks, gentlemen. Um, so I guess my it's not really a question. It's just you mentioned this. I think everybody talked on it with, with the issue of boundaries. When is there any? It's such a gray area, but you know, trying to talk to an athlete or you know even a peer. Um, is there a way to know if you're pushing too much or if you haven't pushed enough to try and get something out of them? Because like even personal experiences, I, I know I've probably talked to people and I might've asked them once, so, you know, like, hey, you know, things look rough, how are things going? Um, you know, and they said, no, things are fine. And then, you know, 24, 48 hours later, I finally had a big breakdown. So that's, you know, and I, I know it's such a tricky thing and there's no like, guidelines for that but i was just wondering advice for you know kind of broaching the subject with somebody yeah can I, I i think i'd love to speak to that um part of it is we you know again we're not responsible for other people's choices so all we can really do is offer the support like it sounds like you did and if they say no one thing you can say is you know, if you ever do want to talk, I'm here for you. And again, they're going to take that how they take it. And if they say no, you can always check back in with them, right? So I know last time I asked you, you, you didn't want to talk about anything. Um, I'm just checking back in. And then you gauge again, like, are they giving you the kind of real cold so shoulder? Or are you noticing a little bit of softening there? And, and just sort of, it's because when people are scared and in denial or just et cetera, any type of, if they sense that that kind of privacy is being threatened, they're gonna shut down and shut down and shut down. So it really becomes our responsibility to leave them alone and to kind of ask ourselves, you know, number one, like, what is it about me that's getting upset that they don't wanna listen? Um, that's a hard one but that's important to reflect on and and just kind of check back in and then lastly i would say if the person's behavior is verging on criminal or verging on like suicidal then as a citizen you kind of have a, a responsibility to call the police or to tell them you're worried and that you have to call the police so i hope that's helpful i also have a video on that too <laughs> but uh i'll share all that stuff after <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's helpful. And then, and sorry, and Joe had a question in the chat too, but I'll let this one ride for a minute and then we'll go. No, I thought um, that was great. Thank you. No problem. James, there's a, a question from Steve. Uh, I would like yep. to answer that if, if you don't mind. Yes. Yeah, so Steve, why don't you uh, jump on is... that? Jump on that. Sorry, Jens. Why don't you jump on that question uh, touching on referral if they don't want uh, to be referred? And then, Mike, if you don't mind, just pull up that uh, thoughts versus feelings slide and that'll cue us to jump over to that next. Okay. Okay. Steve, this uh, can you come on? Can you unmute yourself? Yep. Go ahead. Um, this is a, a situation where it depends on what the the challenges or the issue is that you want him to refer uh first of all it's great that he has the the trusting relationship with i assume with you uh that he only wants to speak with you but if this is a a, a deeper issue where you're deeply concerned about his uh, mental state and mental health then the best way to to approach this is that this is beyond your, your scope of expertise. And if you continue to advise your, your athlete or your patient, whatever you wanna call it, uh, any further, you're actually uh, risking 
to, to get yourself into trouble because you are not qualified to give any advice in regards to mental health, whether it's depression, whether it's uh, uh, anxiety. And it's really important for your athlete to understand that, that you are actually risking to lose your, your license. So if you have a, a very close uh, relationship with him and he still doesn't listen, uh, it becomes challenging and you have to probably take it to your peers, uh, to, your, uh, uh, um, to your director, because like I said, this is a very slippery slope. And uh, if you are taking it too far, you're not doing anyone a favor. Okay. Yeah. It's just uh, yeah, a lot of uh, athletes, you know, like, like we talked about on, on the call, right. will confide in us and a lot of stuff and want to use us as a soundboard almost to yes. vent and, and release their, their thoughts and everything to us. Um, and sometimes, yeah, it definitely goes beyond our scope of practice and you suggest seeing that they see somebody about it, but they refuse to go do it, that they only want to talk to us, right. Um, about it and constantly refuse to go. So um, I like that suggestion about, threatening our yeah. livelihood almost too right and yeah it is definitely challenging uh when i was working as a as an athletic trainer i had similar situations <clears throat> and it's really important that you have a deep conversation with him and then you know if you have to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it just lay it down and explain to him that you are an expert in athletic training and not in psychology or psychotherapy and if that is your concern, it's definitely worth uh, maybe, uh, I don't know if you have any referral sources, but uh, definitely uh, reach out to uh, CCMHS or to one of us. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thanks guys. And, and that Joe- That was great. I'm gonna, yeah, jump, I'm gonna in, jump in there just yeah. for a quick second. Yeah. Because um, that also aligns with the boundary stuff and the kind of scope of practice. So one thing you could say, um, to add on to that, that great feedback is if you want, I'll come with you. Like, I mean, I don't know if that's, if you're willing to do that, but if you are, this is more of a, as a friend kind of thing, but even if it's, I'll come with you to the team doctor, or I'll come with you to the counseling center or whatever, that might be, um, an extra thing you could try to do and see how, how, how that person responds. Yeah, and that actually works great. Like I've done that a couple of times with some athletes and, and they've appreciated it and got the, the foot in the door with counseling to help them along the way, um, knowing that I've been there with them to even set up the appointment, right? So, yeah. Yeah, great. beautiful. That's amazing. Awesome. Yeah, that's really awesome. Um, okay, I'll, I'll talk about this slide quick or James, I interrupted you, so I don't nope. want to. No, yeah, just there was a little bit more clarity uh, desired with this slide. Joe, you're unmuted. So if there's anything specific about it or you just want Mike to go into a little bit more detail. I just if you can use another illustration. I, I used one with the referee is an idiot and bad call. I wonder <laughs> you use another illustration possibly, Mike? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, I'm going to use the simple one for me is when my kids are misbehaving, rather than saying you're making me angry which isn't helpful it's like i think what you're doing is not okay and i'm feeling angry or um like it is a it's so subtle but i really think it's incredibly powerful even to notice it in yourself um what would be another example with like um is that you know like i think the Sorry. Go ahead. Please. No, you just think it's like an eye message. I feel I when you do this, I feel this is like an eye message. Are you familiar with that type of thing? When you do this behavior. Yeah, or, using I statements. Yeah, sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and so there's the I feel this and I think this. And then there's to me, it looks like you are feeling this. Or and so when you're kind of like serving it up for that person to grab hold of it for themselves or not, rather than, you know, if I go up to my kids and say, hey, you're being a little brat and blah, 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 blah. It's like, what's their response is like, you know, <laughs> fucking go screw yourself, dad. It's like, so 
I just find personally, it's this is an incredibly helpful one, even to sort out what's going on inside of me. Um, you might also say, I'm having the thought that X. So I'm having the thought that I'm a horrible person and I'm having the feeling that I feel like angry or sad, or I'm having the feeling of anger or shame or guilt. Um, okay, that's I good. That's Thank you. Yeah, no, really, really helpful, Mike. And, and I've been doing some reading recently as well, sort of outside of the AT scope and, and in sort of this realm, um, not only for this to be a part of this presentation, but for, for my own well-being. And, and I think just placing that word feeling uh, with in front of whatever it is that you are feeling, especially when it's a negative sense, but also the non-attachment to like that euphoric state as well. Um, so that we're not, you know, attaching too high or too low. So when I, I am angry, just by placing the word feeling in front of angry, it separates us from not being that emotion. It's an emotion that we are sensing versus all encompassing. Yeah, it's yeah. huge. It's huge because you're not your feelings or your thoughts. And so, yeah, it's sort of a, a big one. Yeah. yeah. And Tony, I'm just unmuting you here and then uh, you're up. Go for it. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It wasn't uh, so much a question. It was just more like, thank you guys so much for uh, all of the things that you guys are presenting, but especially Mike, um, what you were saying, what you're saying about uh, thinking and feeling and how um, we have to decipher our own feelings and emotions in order to help other people is so huge. And I think a lot of people don't realize that. And that's actually what I'm learning in my helping relations class for massage therapy now um, is that we have to deal, uh, excuse the ex expression with our own shit in order to deal with like other people's <laughs> stuff, you know, because we can't even deal with whatever's in our backyard how are we supposed to help other people you know so it's like helping ourselves in order to help others so i thought everything that you said was really really amazing uh thank you so much for for sharing that i love to hear that you're learning that too in your practice um that's the i mean the comp my company's name is starts with me it's like we have to be I don't know. Anyway, we could go down the whole rabbit hole there too, but um, no, I'm glad I think, you found that out. I, I think we should go down that rabbit hole, Mike, because it, it really <laughs> does. And, and Jens does some similar work. And, and, and I've actually tied the therapeutic side and some of the yoga practices that I've studied and, and mindfulness and meditation and building that into um, self-care. Um, to the point, like, uh, reach out to any one of us and, and talk on this stuff, because uh, I've implemented and not as a plug, but simply as uh, I think it is massively important for us to recognize that self first and whatever we recognize in ourselves, we can then uh, be much more appreciative that that's in everybody else and in everything else as well. And so uh, I've tied this together through um, retreat style uh, workshops where we use physical yoga and we use mindfulness and then we use physical practices of joint care and joint health and some strength and conditioning models and blended it together to really put you the practitioner first so that you can take care of yourself, realize, recognize all of the things in you, you get the output of taking care of yourself and then you develop a skill set of that recognition in me which therefore I can recognize outwardly and, and Mike does some great work like if you if this is the first time you've heard about it um, get on starts with me.ca check it out and uh, and be sure to sort of reach out this is what this is all about is connecting people to things that they may not know have existed before but expertise in the area and, and Jens as well so speak to it a little bit Mike in terms of that self-care and, and what are what's in place. Yeah, I mean, I think personally, <laughs> metaphorically, but in some sense in reality, like it's a matter of life and death for me. I have to take care of myself or I become a miserable human being very quickly. So by by dedicating myself to taking care of myself, I put my put myself in a position to be able to help other people. And I think you and Jens are beautiful examples of that too. And I'm sure a lot of the people on, on this call, like we're here because, you know, in one way or another, we've all been through the shit storm in, in our own way. So it, it just, it's also an, this idea of modeling. So when it comes to like mental illness or mental health disorders or like addiction, whatever, it, it doesn't matter. 
there's a sense of feeling alone and feeling separate from and etc. So the more that we can model to each other that we're all fucked up in our own ways, excuse me, and and that we all got problems and that's okay and etc. You know, that goes an incredibly long way. And we we, you know, think about it like. Okay, I'm just gonna stop. <laughs> anyway, hopefully that that helps as well. Um, and those are ancient. That's ancient wisdom too. And all the modern neuroscience, etc., is all backing it up too. You know, it's sort of this is this is not a secret. We know this stuff, but we like to overcomplicate things, and um, that's hard too. <laughs> <laughs> when we overcomplicate it, then the answers become overcomplicated. But when we oversimplify it, it seems too simple that it can't work. You know what I mean? And and I think those are yeah, yeah, those yeah. are those are those are great points that are kind of you know leaking out as we go. But things that have been around for thousands of years have stuck around for thousands of years because they hold water. Um, a message just came in privately from uh, from a colleague, a mentor, even uh, in the professional space, and and I just want to reiterate that in the AT scope or in the scope of care in general if you suspect if i suspect that an athlete is in distress you must involve a physician in that decision especially if you are a part of a medical team but in within the ethical code you must refer to a physician so make sure that you understand your code of ethics make sure that you understand what your role is but also know that you have a duty of care to refer on because you can't house some of those things where there is suicidal thoughts or thoughts of danger or endangering others. Uh, all of those things are critical, crucial, and that's also duty of care is to understand our code of ethics and, and where we must refer and when we must refer. So uh, appreciate that um, it came through privately. So doesn't, uh, I think that's assuming that he doesn't or she doesn't want to have his or her name out there right now, but that's perfectly great. And I think that's great information that all of us need to reiterate on a regular basis as well. Yeah, and the links are there. I saw that come in the TSN original, uh, the the problem of pain. It's it's. I think there's going to be a second part to it as well. And um, it was a great documentary. There's a lot of good information there. But uh, know the documentaries and know the things that are put into media um, are also told sometimes from one or only half a side of the story. And there's a lot of other information that's left out because you have to cut and edit and do lots of things. So take it with a grain of salt. Use your common sense and know that those are coming from sources of pain as well. And we've talked on it throughout the night those athletes are in pain there's a lot of blame to be had there's blame shifting there's blame sharing uh, and there's partial accountability and we all own a role in that no matter how we cut it things are happening in the pro space they're happening in in the university space and in amateur sport as well or if we continually turn a blind eye to it wherever we are in any world we're no longer listening and that's where um and that's where we need to to continue to open the door and that's again that was the primary target of this evening i hope you've all uh, um, feel like you've benefited in that sense uh, and hopefully beyond as well so um if there are any other questions we're pushing past the 9 30 mark but uh jens and mike if you guys have maybe five or ten more minutes we can we can stay on here and and let the questions roll in Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to stay on for a little bit. Sure. So let's call it uh, let's call it 940. So eight more minutes. So if anybody has any questions, please uh, feel free. Raise your virtual hand or your real hand if you're on camera or both if you want to get very 2020. All right. Or, uh, tumbleweed i posted a link in the <laughs> chat yeah uh for that video i made on di like those separating thoughts and feelings and using i statements and all that stuff and here's the this two years old so i hope it's still totally relevant but uh there's a link to the the little post on mental health versus mental illness and there's a bunch of links to uh cam h and the mental health commission and stuff like that yeah, no, this has been this has been great, guys. And there's a whole bunch of thank yous coming in both privately and in the in the open chat box. And, uh, and listen, the thank yous go beyond just the presenters, too. So we really appreciate your time and, and your willingness to, to put this into your schedule and, and share the conversation. And um, again, 100% of these proceeds will go to advocates and we'll announce where that's going and how it's going. And uh, as we dole that out, and uh, if we do post this, um, it will be for a donation 
dinner for a fee as well. You, you paid to be here, people who picked this up after the fact uh, as well, because there's a lot of money that needs to go to resources like CCMHS uh, and, and and like uh, mm-hmm. Brady's podcast. Uh, Brady's podcast was also posted. Jens, thanks for doing that. It's called Hockey to Heroin. It's mm-hmm. a it's a riveting a riveting story, and every guest he has on different angles and all those kinds of things. And um, and, and the Puck Support Foundation is where Brady has taken his addiction recovery um, to be a source of strength and, and, and definitely a portion of the proceeds here will go to Brady and uh, in support of his foundation and the launch of what he's trying to do. Our contact information is up there. Again, my name is James Gardner. I'm a certified athletic therapist and strength and conditioning specialist, uh, founder of First Star Therapy and host of the First Star Let's Chat podcast an athletic therapy roundtable, Jens Kasten, certified sports psychology coach, Mike Stroh, just completing his MA recently. Congratulations, Mike, again on doing that in counseling psychology, Poppy Desk Clouds, and Krista Van Slinger Land from CCMHS were our panel this evening. Uh, we really appreciate you all for being here live and anybody picking this up after the fact. I'm going to hit record end. If anybody wants to stick around just to say hi, please feel to do so. Feel free to do so. Um, for everybody else, good night and thank you again. This has been, this has been uh, fantastic.